Welcome to the Faster Podcast by Flow Cycling, the podcast where we talk about anything and everything that makes you faster on your bike. This is Season 1, Episode 2, and today we have Mike Schultz, the owner of Highland Training, joining us on the show. Mike has more than 17 years of racing and training experience in multiple cycling disciplines. He is a certified strength and conditioning specialist, personal trainer, and USA cycling coach. Mike competes within endurance and ultra endurance events on a regional and national level and continues to study the science behind sports specific training. Listen to this episode to optimize your training and learn how adding strength and conditioning work to your program can help you become a faster cyclist. All right, Mike, thank you so much for coming to the show. Welcome. Uh, looks like you're in Pennsylvania. So are you getting a little snow today? Yeah, about uh, three, four inches this morning. So um, another round of uh, some snowy cycling outside. All right. Are you a skier at all? Absolutely. Uh, oh, okay. Cross, cross country is, uh, I, I would put it um, right behind cycling. It's, uh, it's amazing, um, especially when you can ski the single track around here. Very nice. Very nice. Um, all right, Mike. So we got a big show today. Uh, I think we're going to basically get straight into it. We have a lot of questions today. We're going to talk about not only the coaching benefits of working with uh, a personalized coach, uh, but you're also a, a strength and conditioning coach. So we want to talk about that as well. So let's get started. Um, we've done a couple interviews on this podcast already with the guys from Trainer Road and and their coaching plans are kind of a predefined thing that you start and you follow. Um, they're great. They work really, really well. But there is a bit of a one-size-fits-all uh, approach to that. Um, in, uh, computerized training programs also really can't measure things like fatigue, injury, stress, uh, if you had a busy day at work or your kids are sick. Um, and one-on-one -on -one coaching is really far more specialized. So, Mike, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. And uh, what are some things that a coach can pick up on that is a, that a virtual training plan cannot? Many things. Um, and let me just say that the virtual training plans are great. Um, they're they're a great direction. And uh, there are so many out there that just you know go on feel and train off a of feel. So, getting into a, a training plan is a great first step. Um, when you introduce a coach to the situation, you now have an extra set of eyes. Um, and on the coaching side, you know, we're looking at um, your stress scores each week and how you're handling those stress scores each week, along with how you're handling life. Um, and there's a lot of variables in life, as you know, um, and with work and family. Um, there are very few people in this uh, world who, um, you know, make a living off of cycling. Um, so the majority of people have to work. <laughs> um, and, you know, from, but from a coach's standpoint, um, just through notes on the computer, you know, I can see exactly where everyone is mentally. And mentally tells me a lot about where they are physically. And so we have all these metrics, you know, you have power metrics, you have heart rate metrics, um, you have the coaching program itself where you're trying to push people to reach certain metrics and you're, you know, you're looking at all of this stuff going, okay, can they reach these metrics today? How did they feel overall? You know, are, are they irritable? Are they, are they tired? Are they over the training pro program? You know, so all these things, um, are something a coach will, uh, take in and then say, this is where we need to go next. And that is something that a preset coaching program can't do. You need to essentially coach yourself with a preset coaching program. Um, very, very cool. And that makes a lot of sense. It's, it's hard to get that personal touch and feel from, from a, 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 like a virtual training plan. Exactly. Um, so w one thing that we talk a lot about in, in training is, is recovery. And uh, it's really hard for sometimes a virtual training plan to know that you need specific recovery. So how do you know when an athlete maybe needs a day off or an easier workout. And you, you mentioned training stress. So what do you use to, to know that? Well, okay. So um, the way I look at it is, or I try to describe it to everyone, is like you have a dashboard um, of all of these metrics. And uh, the one metric will be heart rates. And then we have power. Um, and then we have uh, feel, uh, leg, like soreness. Uh, how sore are your legs? Uh, okay. how, how sore are you in the morning? How do you feel overall? 
we have the mental aspect of it. Like, are you reaching your mental limits? That's something people don't speak about very often. Um, <laughs> they all think about the physical limits, but then they forget about the mental limits. And if you push an athlete too far mentally, then it doesn't matter what happens physically because they'll be over it. And right. so, you know, <laughs> it, it, the mental, yeah, our brains, like it's a muscle. So we need to train it the same way. Um, but you're looking at all this stuff and, um, the one big metric I use, the two big metrics I use, um, will be heart rate and, uh, um, that daily feel or that daily perceived exertion. So, you know, I didn't analyze that first and then I look at power. So, um, with heart rate and we can get into heart rate more as we discuss. Um, and, uh, but you know, you have trends with heart rate and when it's hard to elevate heart rate on certain days, um, it's usually related to a lower power output. And so, okay. um, when I start seeing those trends and I, I have people, it's really hard when you're on the bike to be looking at your power meter the whole time. So I'm always <laughs> suggesting that it's, you'll, you'll produce more power if you're just focused on the effort. Um, but I try to get people to use heart rate as a guide because it's easier to glance at that and say, okay, I'm almost in range and then work a hard effort. And then we look at power. So, um, <laughs> Yeah. So you're looking at more of a, my heart rate is here and how is power responding to that? So if a day where I'm, let's say I go out and I'm feeling really, really great and I'm riding at 140 beats per minute, my power may be higher at that heart rate on a day where I feel great Correct. versus a day where I'm maybe overtrained or fatigue at the same heart rate, my power might be a lot lower. Correct. Um, okay. And, you know, and again, we'll get into heart rate in a second, but um, once you figure out heart rate ranges, um, I've been studying heart rate for 20 years. And so, um, wow. and over the past 10 years, you know, viewing, I don't know, working full time as a coach, I'm in 60, <laughs> 70,000 power and heart rate files, um, you tend to have this little computerized uh, our computer in your brain and you, 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 you know trends. You can see trends amongst athletes and whether they're age groupers or they're super elites, they all share the same trends. Um, and so, um, yes, um, at heart rates, the goal is, is to increase power at all heart rate ranges. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Awesome. It's, it's okay. interesting. Last night, I, I actually had a, a really hard workout and I walk my, my dog every morning. And, uh, you know, most mornings I get up, it feels feels great. But this morning I got up and I felt like I was pumping molasses through my veins walking up this hill. I was like, oh, man, I, I really, yeah, I might have overdid it a little bit last night. <laughs> so I, I hear you. Um, yeah. So, so Mike, talk, talking about that, and I think one of the big reasons, you know, I, I've had a long history with injury, and I, I think part of that goes to just, you know, working a full-time job. I was starting a business. I was training 15 to 20 hours a week. And mm -hmm. I think overtraining is this big fear that as triathletes or cyclists, we all have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so what a, what a personal coach can do is really kind of help look at all of those things, like you said, even the mental side of it, and and try and prevent that. So what can happen to an athlete when they overtrain? Well, um, <clears throat> this is an interesting topic, and I've done a lot of writing on this. Okay. Um, and there's some there's periods of the overtraining. So you have um, uh, you you push limits, right? Um, and uh, the first stage of overtraining is technically considered overreaching. Okay. And when you overreach, that's when. Okay, so we have one week of training in, two weeks of training in. If you're a high-end athlete and you're putting in 15 hours a week, um, you know, you're starting to build fatigue. And then in that third week of training, we say, let's try to do as many hours as we can. And we're watching heart rate. And in the beginning of the week, the heart rate's not responding well. Power's a little bit low. And you're like, all right. And maybe you throw in a race in there. Who knows? Um, you know, now you're, you're building a, a lot of fatigue and you're showing it early in the week, but we say press on and you go through that week. And at the end of the week, you're miserable. You need a break. <laughs> yeah. You, you like drop your phone on the floor and you're, you're, you're swearing at yourself. Like you, that's the irritability we look at. Um, your spouse says something, you, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm going to. And so we look, we, we find those signs of irritability and we say, all right, you're now overreaching. And that goes along with all the other biofeedback we're seeing with power and with heart rate, putting great hours, time to rest. Overreaching in general will take about two weeks to recover from. So um, you can use, technically, it's part of overtraining. So you're actually kind of using that overtraining for a training adaptation. And if you space it or time it right in the year, you can do that a few times a year 
um, and then come back really strong. Yep. Now, if you go beyond the overreaching point, which is an imaginary point, like there's no specific, you know, timeline of exactly when you're going to hit that overtraining uh, mark. I've seen a lot of athletes overtrain and they've come to me overtrain. Um, and it's really hard to work with them at that point because they have a hard time elevating power. Um, they kind of hit a plateau um, and they need months of detraining. Um, so, wow. um, you know, and in the strength and conditioning field, the one thing I've always learned is that out of a hundred people, there's going to be two or three people that are not going to be part of the norm. They're going to be able to overtrain. They, they may even keep making gains and maybe that's due to genetics, but the other 97 are going to fall apart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Very, very good point. <laughs> cool. Um, there's some very interesting things that, you know, I think Chris and I both being engineers, we think numbers and we think, um, you know, if we're going to train, we're going to go off a couple things. And so you've also, you've also brought up another interesting point, which is sort of this perceived effort concept. And so if you can kind of give us uh, just a kind of elevator pitch of the, of the three metrics that we've kind of talked about already, the first one being heart rate, um, the first one being power-based training, or the second one being power-based training, and the third one being like perceived effort training. Can you kind of give us the elevator pitch of each one of those so that we just have a general understanding of what that means and how it fits to an athlete's training? Sure. Um, well, heart rate to start with. And again, I've studied this. I've written on this. I've, uh, you know, it is heart rate's genetic. And okay. so let me give you an example. I have a 55-year-old guy in Michigan uh, who has a threshold heart rate and I'll discuss threshold in a second, of 180 beats. Um, I've worked with them for seven years. It's wow. never changed, right? Um, I have a threshold heart rate of 185 beats. I'm 44 years old, and I've had that same heart rate for 20 years. So wow. if I go do a cross race, I'll usually average in the 180 range, like 182 or 183. I don't think it's... I, I don't personally take heart rate very precise. So if someone scores a 183 or 184 for a threshold heart rate. Um, I, I look at threshold heart rate as like a 10 minute all out time trial effort at least. Um, I've had great success with that, you know, eight to 10 minute range and looking for an average heart rate. And again, heart rate's genetic. So, you know, I have the 55 year old guy in Michigan who is a 180 threshold. He can average 180, you know, at the short races. And I have a 32 year old professional, again, out of Michigan, who has a threshold heart rate of 165. That's like me. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and so, you know, a, a lot of times guys are on rides and they're like, well, what's your heart rate? What's your heart? Well, you know what? You shouldn't do that because, <laughs> you know, everyone has different genes and different parents. So, you know, just go off a perceived effort and, you know, ride together. But my, my point with heart rate is, is that um, when it comes to the threshold part, now, that's a misunderstood part, and I could go into it forever on this, um, it, you know, with the blood lactate testing and so forth. Found just great results with doing a time trial. Um, threshold heart rate, it's just a steady state. It's basically um, when you're going the hardest you can go, um, how open are your veins and how strong is your heart and how much and how all that's working together, and it produces this average heart rate. And what I've seen is once we figure out that average heart rate, it never changes. Like it, I will say sometimes it will increase. So I'll, I'll discover someone at 170 and after some focus training, after six months, they go to a cross race and they're like, Hey, Mike, I just averaged 175 at the cross race for 20 minutes. Okay, cool. We're going to go up 175 now. Um, so maybe that's the heart getting stronger or it, it, it expands, uh, the, you know, the left ventricle expands and so forth. Um, so with heart rate based training, um, the elevator pitch is you want to figure out that threshold number and then you can base your ranges off of that. And that okay. is a start. Nice. Now with, with power, um, we tend to look at, well, FTP. Um, everyone uses FTP. It's a functional, uh, training power. You know, you train there, you get stronger. It's a great number. Um, with power, I use both heart rate and power together. So I'm pushing people with the heart rate range and seeing how much power they can put out. Um, you know, power is a great metric. And I would say that there's a few ways to use it. You can use it as zones, which I don't think is wise because sometimes it pushes you too hard physiologically. Okay. Um, I, I tend to use power as looking at the trends each week. So we, 
we give someone a training uh, program to go and tackle, and then we see what happens with power. And yeah. so we hopefully power is up. And if we've attacked the right zones and the right energy systems and so forth, then, you know, that's what we see over time. And so that metric um, using power, uh, it, I feel, is the best way. Now, we can get into discussing peaking for races and, and not focusing on heart rate and stuff like that. Um, but in general, um, those are two great metrics that you can put together, but they both are telling a different story. Okay. Um, now, the third one was, again... Perceived effort, yeah. Now, perceived effort fits into the whole picture because while you're at a, a certain heart rate range, if you have a low perceived effort, you know, hey, man, the day is going well. And so... <laughs> you're, I love you're, those days. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, you know, the wind's flowing through your air. Everything's <laughs> beautiful, right? And you're, you're, you're pumping out at, at 180 beats a minute and you're doing a, a threshold effort and you look down, your power's 350 watts and it's like, bam. And, and that's a great day. And so, you know, you note those days in training. Um, and usually they come when you're well rested or when you, you reach peak form. And, um, you know, so, but perceived effort also tells you when you're starting to get fatigued. So like when you say, hey, go and work some of these endurance ranges on the heart rate side, push as much power as you can. And you're out there and you're like, well, I'm reaching the power numbers. I'm, I'm tempo at 165 beats a minute or whatever your heart rate range is and powers 300 watts. But man, that was labored. That sucked. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, for sure. Yeah, I, I love those notes, by the way, in training programs. Yeah. <laughs> they make me laugh, right? Um, yeah. But uh, so you look at that and you're like, all right, it's not a sign of fatigue. Everything's responding. Heart rate's responding. Your dashboard power's responding. All right, perceived exertion's up. Okay, cool. We'll take note of that. And then we look at the trends over the week and, you know, usually week by week is, is what I'm in touch. And again, awesome. this, is, this is how I'm able to view exactly where everyone's at. Sweet. Awesome. Sweet. Chris, what was that race that you did in Utah that was at uh, a, a uh, great I, elevation? So I, I lived in Vegas at the time, 3,000 feet elevation, and I did this race that was at seven or eight thousand feet and uh <laughs> I, re I remember chris was I, I, yeah he was I read all these books and i was like oh it says if you if you race within a 24-hour window you won't be affected by elevation so <laughs> i go out i win the swim i'm off the front of the bike i'm having this great race i'm holding the number i'm supposed to hold 10 minutes into the bike i'm breathing like a guy with asthma i couldn't i was horrible <laughs> yeah and i remember looking and i'm trying to i'm engineer so i'm like trying to do like this calculation in my head i'm like heart rate should be here power should be here i'm looking at power it's on but heart rate is through the roof and i'm like i gotta dial back mm -hmm. and it it ruined the run i went from first to freaking fourth <laughs> on the run and it was horrible <laughs> i remember chris came home from that race and he was like Man, everything was on. And then he goes, he, t he told me the whole story. And he's like, then I realized I was at like 8,000 feet elevation. I'm like, well, that, that may have something to do with it. So that kind of that kind of actually leads into a, a question, you know. I mean, if you look at power, power is, it's always consistent. You've, you've got, you're, you know, if it's 60 degrees outside, 100 degrees outside, power is the same. If you're at sea level or 8,000 feet, power is the same. And, you know, even if you're, if you're overnight, if you're well rested or you're not well rested, power is the same. Um, heart rate is obviously affected by all of these things. So mm -hmm. I guess, you know, as an athlete, you know, you're told to listen to your bodies. So mm -hmm. in certain situations, is heart rate better than power for these certain things? And if, and if not, you know, are there specific um, workouts where heart rate or power are more effective? Yeah, there, there are. And um, if we look at your specific example about going from 3,000 feet to 8,000 feet and doing right. a race, um, I would probably have suggested to ignore heart rate in that situation. And honestly, in most races, I tell people to ignore heart rate and go off of feel. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we use heart rate in training um, and it's easy to use heart. You know, we're always at the same elevation and, you know, we're used to the uh, temperatures and stuff outside. There's less flux with heart rate when it comes to that. But in these extreme examples, there's going to be flux. So, yeah. you know, I had a guy do a race in Leadville. It's his 10,000 feet last yeah. year. And uh, he's elite, super elite, really fast guy, works hard. Um, and his heart rate, he is a 185 threshold, and he wasn't able to get his heart rate over 170 for most of the race. Um, and wow. he, he ended up finishing, I think, like top 10 or 15 in that race. It was a pro race. Um, so he did well. Uh, but again, you know, he's coming from a lower elevation. Now, when it comes to power, sure, power is the same. You're going to produce the same power. But 
can you sustain the power that you produce at 3,000 feet at 8,000 feet? No. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chris no. learned that the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so you just have less, you, you can just, you can use less oxygen at that point. Um, and uh, the 24 hour, it's a good tactic because I think it takes about 24 to 36 hours before like some changes in the blood start happening. I, th- I may have read it. It starts happening right away. So like if you're on a plane, I think the elevation inside of a plane is like six or 7,000 feet. Yep. Um, you know, but plane rides are short. Uh, and, and, and then you get off the plane. And, and so, you know, there's a plasma thing that goes on and, you know, the, the red blood cell thing that goes on. And once that happens, that, that window of three days is like the worst three days. Forever. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. 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 Awesome. Crazy. And so, you know, when you look at heart rate and, and power or those two different types or even perceived effort, are any of them better for the specific phases of training like base, build, and peak? Are you focusing on, you know, one all through all three or are you focusing on them in individual ranges? Well, we use them all always. And, okay. but yes, I mean, early in the season, like now, um, when people are doing base miles, um, you know, we're, we tend to use heart rate. Uh, as a main guy, yep. especially here's here's a good one. Um, and when you're doing base miles and tempo, you're usually doing that stuff mainly seated and spinning. And that's a prime time to look at your power meter because, you know, you could be if you're on an open road, nothing in front of you. Um, that's where you kind of, all right, we set your tempo heart rate zone. So um, let's go back to the 180 threshold. All right. Uh, if you have a 180 threshold. Um, tempo would be like in the one mid 160s, let's say, right? Yep. So I would set a goal and say, all right, um, let's try to do some 10, 20 minute efforts at like right around 165 heart rate. I want you to cap heart rate at 170 today because it does have some flux, okay. but I want you to push as much power as you can in that range. Okay. okay. So, you know, when you do that, okay, now you're targeting a specific energy system um, and heart rate is one of those guides that guides you towards focusing on an energy system. So I say, you know, you can set these power numbers, but what's happening with the physiological side? And so right. if you're trying to push a certain power number and you're going out for tempo, but then your heart rate's not at 165 or 167, it's at 180. Well, then are you really working aerobically? Pro- probably not. Like, where's do the talk test, you know, can you speak the same? <laughs> right. You might be spitting words, right? So nothing more yeah. annoying than when you're riding with a group of guys that's stronger than you and they're trying to talk to you and you're like, just go ahead of me. Just please just leave. Me. Just let me ride by myself. <laughs> that happens a lot for John. Yeah, it does. <laughs> the what? what? What did you say? I can't hear you. I, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so yeah, to answer your question uh, early in the year, um, you know, you focus on heart rate. When the efforts get shorter, that's when heart rate is not as precise. Um, so anything, because it does take, it could take a few minutes for heart rate to respond. It could take half a workout. So, you know, you kind of, um, when you're, when you're focused on 30 second efforts or a minute efforts or race pace efforts, you tend to say, well, like I said before, don't look at your power meter. Go as hard as you can up that hill for 30 seconds. That's okay. it. Leave it at that. Right. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so if, if an athlete is feeling overtired or stressed, uh, w- what are the best indicators to adjust? Do you want to adjust for, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is, you know, you want to go with the perceived effort and heart rate. If we're overtired and overstressed, we'd want to just sure. gauge that. And if our power drops within that range, that would be a good, a good guess. You need to rest. That's yeah. the adjustment. Right. And so, uh, okay. right. And that, that is this, the number one mistake that all athletes make is that they don't rest long enough. Um, <laughs> and so, athletes? yeah, <laughs> that surprises <laughs> well, everyone, me. <laughs> the type one, you know, uh, you know motivated, uh, I want to get out there and I can't stand. Um, the problem with resting is that you reach that point where you need rest and you're irritable and, you know, you're sore and what makes you feel good? exercise yeah right so it it, you you're sitting the people i get to rest and i'm like just listen to me and rest like don't do anything today right and you know they're sitting there and they're driving themselves crazy but after three or four days they're like hey i'm really motivated right mental's coming back like (laughs) yeah hey i got a good night's sleep last night and i woke up and i can't wait to go get my easy workout in today and then by the weekend it's like boom i felt amazing and then into the next week you know and so 
we're, we go from looking at the trends of stress to the trends of how are you recovering. Okay, let's yeah. let's just make it very clear here for all of us type A people listening to this podcast. <laughs> rest. Rest doesn't mean take your four hour bike ride to a two hour right. easy ride, does it? What does rest mean to the coach? <laughs> well, rest, you know, you can do all the calculations. A lot of people say do 25% of what you normally do or 30% or 50% of what you normally do. Um, rest means, uh, you know, taking a day or two off. If you've really pushed it hard, take two days off. Uh, okay. Do some stretching, foam roller stuff. Maybe go for a 20 minute jog. Um, just to kind of loosen the muscles up and then come in and do some foam. Okay, so after a few days, then maybe do some easy spins. You can do some easy runs. You could do some pull work, you know, but keep it easy. Um, you know, maybe uh, maybe focus on some form stuff, you know, focus on different things. And then by the weekend, start to test the legs, um, see where the mind's at. You know, you're waking up, you know, you want to go from, you know, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the hard training where you're mentally – just over it to, hey, I can't wait to, to get out on the bike today. I can't Good. wait, you know? Okay. And so those are signs of rest and uh, you have to get there. That's very important. Okay. All right. Shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk kind of about individual athletes. And there's there's a saying I used to train with, uh, I talked about this in a, in a previous episode, but I used to train with Angela Nath, a pro triathlete. And she would always say horses for courses. And what that means is Certain athletes are, you know, better sprint athletes. Other athletes are better long distance athletes. And she would always say that that even comes into the training element of it. So some athletes, in her opinion, uh, responded better to low intensity training and really not doing a lot of high intensity training where other athletes can just take tons of high intensity training and they respond to it really well. Personally, maybe this was in my mind, but I felt like if I did a lot of high intensity training, it would lead me to injury more and I didn't respond as well to the training. So let's start with just the response to training. Do some athletes respond better to low intensity training versus high intensity training? I think there's some truth to that. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say that um, when you, you know, you break down the cross-sectional of muscle and you compare it from one person to the next, you know, um, someone's going to have more type two fibers compared to the other person who's more type one fibers. Okay. Um, and, you know, I, I was thinking about this question uh, before we talked today and, you know, you just look at other sports like, yeah. um, like, you, you know, can, could Chris Froome or, you know, an elite triathlete um, uh, build the legs that are as big as some of the biggest NFL players? You know, yeah. pro probably not. No, um, not at I don't. You could pound them with weights and protein, but they probably would never do it. Um, so, sure. It, 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 when you look at that, then it's genetics. You know, some people are built for certain things. Uh, figuring that out, now that's a hard thing to do. Yeah. Personally, it, just going on feel and perceived effort, I, I felt like I trained... Well, we sponsored Josh Omberger for a while too. And I, I kind of came from this higher intensity thing. And then I started training with him. And every ride we'd go on, he's like, just you're going too hard. And I'm like, <laughs> but you're a pro. You should be like dropping me. And he's like, no, dude, slow down. Mm -hmm. So we were doing like a four hour ride that day. And I was going out and I had this effort. And he's like, what are you doing? And I said, what do you mean? I said, we're going to try and hold an effort for this long. He says, no, 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 no. What's the objective of a long ride? And I said, I don't know. He says, to ride your bike for a long time. That's it. Right. So <laughs> it kind of really, and it was a, it was a great point, but what it really made me realize was you don't have to go hard all the time. When I started implying that or adding that to my own training, mm -hmm. I, I, it worked great for me. And that's what led to that question because I noticed when I really dropped the intensity and maybe only a week or two before a race added the sharpness, it mm -hmm. worked well. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. So one more thing based on that is, and I, I think this is kind of an obvious question, but can the the type of training? So we have the high intensity stuff versus the low intensity stuff. Mm -hmm. Does that increase chance for injury? Yeah, it depends on how much high intensity or you know length of rides. Um, and you know, there's the muscle balance thing. There is important as we're getting into talking about strength training. Okay. Um, I'm a big yoga buff. Uh, I think really? yoga. Yeah, I think yoga is as much as I've learned about strength and conditioning and all the you know. I look at like some types of yoga, like Ashtanga yoga or like a flow yoga, um, as a really ideal, um, because it's, it's very aerobic. Um, and so, but yeah, if you're, if you're out there, um, you know, hammering every single day, um, then, you know, you're going to create tight muscles. A lot of people get 
tight lower backs, um, you know, tight hip flexors, um, knee problems, you know, <laughs> the muscles get so tight, they actually, it actually moves the kneecap, you know, if, if you ever yep. have that happen, then you need to go see someone. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With prep that doctor, uh, and, and it's, yeah, something for the mental too. But, uh, yeah, I, I would say that um, there's a balance between the, the 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 low, you know, long slow stuff and the high intensity stuff. And on a note, on the low intensity stuff, it can't be too low intensity. There's there's a bottom end of that. Um, okay. If you're working too easy, then sure, you're burning fat and you're you know you're trying to build that mitochondrial density, but are you going hard enough to get those gains? So, um, you know. Okay, there's a balance, yeah. That's sure. cool. I another another guy I used to know a little bit was Mark Bostead, another pro triathlete, knew Josh. That he went and had a, a blood lactate test done, and his the low end of his aerobic was like 114 or something like that. And uh, so I was talking to him one night, and I was like, "So if you do your long rides, this is right after Josh kind of told me to ride easier." And I was like, "Where's your heart rate?" He's like, "114." And I asked him another question. It was like, where's your heart rate? 114. And after like three or four different questions, it was always 114. So I was giving Josh a hard time. He's like, what are you doing today? I'm like, riding in the Mark Bose dead zone. 114. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Um, anyway, so, so shifting gears a little bit. Um, obviously, to, to get faster on your bike, you have to ride your bike. And that's the specificity side of, of training, right? right. Now... Uh, another component of training that we we often hear about is is strength training, but few of us actually know if that if it helps. Mm -hmm. And even if we do think it helps, uh, many of us really have no idea what type of strength training we should be doing as cyclists. So, let's start with um, how does how does strength training help us become better cyclists? And in in doing strength training, what actually happens to the body that allows us to become better cyclists? Well. Um, let's look at strength training um, and, and, and the possible benefits for a cyclist. Now, I just wrote an article um, on strength training for Training Peaks, and it was amazing to see how many people um, were giving me um, some kickback on it because uh, there's, there's a few, few beliefs, you know, and I believe in uh, a lot of reps and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, endurance work with strength training, and there's a lot of people that believe in lifting really heavy weight. Um, but, and I'll talk about that in a second, but strength training in general – um, the goal is is to get a stronger body from head to toe um, because you know, your core is important. A lot of people don't focus on the core, and they have really strong legs. But if they're if you especially if you're doing longer races and or if you're doing triathlons and so forth, and you're running, as soon as your core fatigues, then your legs go, and so you'll <laughs> slow down. Um, okay. And so, like when I look at strength training, um, it is to um, Increase the strength of all assistance muscles related to your main sport. And I say that because there's nothing like cycling. And there is a few things like running. There's some more similar strength training moves for running. Um, okay. Swimming, uh, you know, obviously uh, in the pool work is as specific as you get. Um, and, you know, when you look at cycling, for example, um, the pedal stroke happens on the metatarsals of the foot. And so no matter how strong that base of your shoe is, all that pressure is going through the metal tarsals of the foot. Okay. When you're lifting weights in, in home or in a gym, let's look at an Olympic lift, like a squat or a deadlift, you're doing that with both feet flat on the ground. Okay. And so you, you, when you look at the, the flow of energy, um, it's going to be slightly different when you do that deadlift compared to when you're, you're doing on the bike. And so for that sake, you know, like we, we said earlier, if you want to get strong on a bike, you've got to ride the bike. But when it comes to strength training, that's why I view it as, um, okay, not everything's going to transfer. So let's try to focus on the most specific things. Um, and, uh, let's try to train as many like assistance muscles. So if you're, you're doing, if you're doing motions similar to cycling and running, while strength training, you're going to hit those assistance muscles. Um, okay. that, that's my view on it. And, yeah. and so like this, the squat or the deadlift, you're saying that because the power has to go through your foot, the metatarsals on the bike, you're getting some, some um, benefit because when you're doing a, a, a deadlift or a, a, a squat, <clears throat> the power is also going through the metatarsals in your feet. Is that what you're just getting at? I'm saying that the, when you're doing a deadlift and a squat, your foot is flat on the ground. Okay. So, right. you know, the way that it's uh, the flow through the muscles as you press upward, it's going to be different than cycling. Okay, right. but there's still a, a relation 
because eventually the 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 strength has to transfer from your foot through your leg, I guess, Correct. right? Okay, yeah. and that's where that's where it comes. So it's different, but you're still getting a benefit because there's similarities in the chain, basically. There are, and yeah, e- e- even for your hips, you know, strengthening your hips through squats. I I, I think Olympic lifts are great. I think free weights are great. Um, you know, because I I'm not a fan of machines. I'm, I'm a fan of machines if there's injury involved or if you're very right. new. Um, yeah. but if you're experienced and you want to really gain some strength, um, doing a squat. Or a deadlift, um, it, it incorporates the core. Um, okay. overhead, overhead presses incorporates the core. And so you're now strengthening your trunk. Um, and that relates to cycling. That will directly relate to cycling. Um, you know, uh, but uh, there are other specific things you can do for cycling and running um, that uh, we can talk about. But uh, okay. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, very, very, very cool. Um, okay, so if we look at power on the bike, power is essentially work over time, right? So how much work can you perform over a given amount of time? Right. So if we if we think of that in a weightlifting capacity, um, if we can lift 200 pounds one time, mm-hmm. uh, that's less power than lifting 200 pounds 20 times. So w- does weightlifting power transfer to bike power. So if, if we take, um, we have a, a one rep max of, of a squat of 200 pounds and we build that up to 20 reps, mm-hmm. does that transfer directly to the bike? Well, yes and no. Um, if So if you're training, let's just say you start at the one rep max. Let's okay. forget about lifting 20 reps of it. Um, okay. So you start at the one rep max. The most you can put up is, is 200 pounds. Okay. Um, you're using anaerobic systems to make that lift. So a one rep max is going to happen within seconds. Okay. Um, and I like, I like this comparison with power. I use this all the time. Um, let's compare an Olympic lift uh, um, and energy systems. An Olympic lift happens within two seconds. So you actually, you're not using oxygen at all. They use um, the, the phosphogen system. Um, and, uh, you know, it, within two seconds, it's up and done. Okay. Yep. That equivalent on the bike in power would be a, you know, two to three to four second sprint power. And so, um, you know, okay, the one rep max, that's anaerobic energy. That's what you're using. The three second sprint, anaerobic energy. It's what you're using. So if a professional cyclist can do 1500 watts, some of the top sprinters can get close to 2000 watts. Um, you know, that's, that's anaerobic energy. Now, um, Let's think about the rest of the bike race. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. Uh, okay, yeah, that's where that, this is where the meat of the, um, the, the, the question's answered is that, okay, the sprint's over. Well, then what happens? Um, so if you're in the gym always training for the one rep max, you're training those anaerobic systems that are used on the bike, but are not used as much as the aerobic systems. Okay. So it's better to start off right away and focus on the 20 reps to okay, build yeah. endurance. And that's, I, I think I could have framed my question better. I guess it, it would have been better if I said, if I can do 20 reps at 100 pounds and I build that to 20 reps at 200 pounds, then that's going to transfer to better power on the bike, right? And that's the kind of muscular adaptation we're looking for. Sure. I mean, you want to do um, more reps because, um, okay, when you, you develop lactic acid and you develop the byproducts that need to be cleared within the muscles while you're cycling, we'll just use cycling, for example. And, and that happens in the legs, but it's cleared throughout the entire body. Like when I study blood, blood lactate trends, I'm taking a poke from the finger. Um, and so what that tells you is that the more aerobically trained your entire body is, the faster you will clear that lac, that acid and the faster you will recover from hard efforts. So you then go back and you look at, um, okay, so should I be lifting really heavy weights as heavy as I can trying for one rep maxes? And I do Ironmans. Um, okay, well, are, are those one rep maxes where you're training those anaerobic systems? And when you train anaerobic systems, they have a tendency to come and go. This is why people can peak at certain times of the year. And you can only peak so many times because the anaerobic systems that you use in cycling, um, some of the systems have aerobic and anaerobic properties. And so they have both. And so like you push them towards the anaerobic side. They make those gains, but then if you don't use them or they become fatigued fast, they go back. And so or you lose the power there. And so that's why, in my opinion, it's more, it's better to focus on a lot of reps to build endurance, you know, 
Um, okay. And we can Makes talk sense. about specific exercises and so forth. Very cool. Yeah, that makes Very a lot cool. of sense. Uh, John, so, um, so Mike, if we look at this, um, what what type of workout should we do? I guess leading in, so that's that's a that's the basic science of it, I guess. So looking at this now, what type of workout should we do? And can you maybe give us a bit of an example um, of what we should what we should focus on in the workouts? Sure. Um, well, like we just said, the Olympic lifts. Um, the squats, the deadlifts, um, you know, training your hamstrings, it's really important. Um, and, uh, you know, like overhead presses and so forth. Um, those are all great. And I think that they should be incorporated in all strength training programs. Um, deadlifts is, is, it's the one exercise you don't really recommend a ton of repetitions because the, the hamstrings are really sensitive. Um, so it's best to start off with like five reps of, you know, whatever weight would be appropriate for you for, for a deadlift. Um, and then maybe work up to 10 reps and so forth. But like squats um, and overhead presses and things like that, um, you should use weight where you can complete at least 15 reps. I, I try to shoot for 20 plus reps. Um, uh, some other great exercises to include um, are single leg exercises, um, like, uh, like split squat jumps, which is a good plyometric exercise um, where you're in a squat and you're jumping into the air and switching legs in the air and landing, and then you're immediately exploding again. Um, uh, you do single leg step ups. So like if you get a box um, and you can put your leg on that box or a chair and your knees at 90 degrees, you can add weight or not, and you just step up onto the box and then work one leg at a time for 15 reps. Okay. Um, that builds great endurance. Um, so single leg stuff, um, kettlebells. I love kettlebells. Uh, um, I think uh, kettlebell swings are explosive. Um, I think it's a uh, it's a great way to produce um, that explosive power um, that everyone talks about. But again, we don't want to create that explosive power for three reps and, and be doing it with two hundred pounds. We want to be able to do sets of twenty to twenty five. Think about it. You know, you're cycling, you're pedaling at eighty reps a minute for hours and <laughs> yeah. hours. So why would we be focused on three reps? No, we're focused on 20 reps. And another great tip is circuit training. You do one exercise, you go right to the next exercise, you go right to the next exercise. So it gives you a little break between exercises and it's really aerobic. And you get done with 10 exercises and then you take a few minutes, a breather, check out the room, get back into it. And then you do another, another circuit. Maybe you do three rounds. Maybe you do four rounds. That builds you aerobically. Um, okay. Those are great. That's super cool. So basically what you're saying is you're kind of incorporating the aerobic side by doing the circuit training. And then you're doing a lot of functional full body stuff that incorporates the core and the whole body. And on top of that, you're actually doing some of these like kinetic chain exercises like step ups that are going to simulate what you're doing on the bike. Correct. And, and another good one is steps, running steps. Um, well, for, for runners in general, uh, the force work is good uh, for the hills. And uh, for cyclists, when you run steps, um, again, you're doing it on the metatarsals of the foot. Nice. Um, so, nice. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome stuff. So when you start to look at strength training, you know, how many days a week are you rec recommending somebody actually puts that in and, and how long does that take? And, and the, you know, the final question of that is, is this a seasonal thing? Is this better in the off season? Is this better? You know, how, do, how does that all work together? Year round. Um, and okay. I think it keeps good balance, but in the summertime, you need a lot less um, because you have a lot more fatigue on the bike and um, you want to save your legs for the bike as well. Um, in the wintertime, um, I have some go through a heavy lift phase where we do focus on the three to five reps if that's early in the uh, you know yeah. preseason. And then we get into season, you know, we're focusing on those circuits and we're focusing on um, this is in the base season, um, you know, the 20 plus rep per set. Um, I see two days a week as like one really hard day in the gym and then yep. another like half, half as hard. Um, you could add like, let's say a yoga workout in there midweek. I think that would be enough. But when you start getting into four or five strength training days a week, then all of a sudden you're taking away from the run and the bike. Um, and again, I, I work with some elite elites and, uh, they, they, once we see them, um, not being able to put the power output, which I've seen time and time again, then we kind of back off the strength training. Yes. Yeah. You want to put the power output on the bike. That's how you yep. Make it. Yep. You, you've brought up a, this a couple times now, and it's, it's kind of, it kind of coincides with something that I found out a, a few years ago. I was, you know, I was riding the bike a lot 
Um, and I found that, you know, I felt like my legs were strong. I felt great. You know, I felt, you know, I could, you know, anaerobically I was, I was getting a lot better. Um, but one of the things I found was I was just, I had aches and pains and I just, I, I don't know. I just, I just didn't feel the best, you know, in other areas, my lower back was starting to bother me. Mm-hmm. And so I started to do a lot of research and I, I came across this thing, uh, it's, uh, it's called, it's it's basically called gymnastic strength training, which I get made fun of for a lot because everyone says I'm doing gymnastics. <laughs> so it's a common thing Chris teases me about. I definitely make fun yeah, of him for that. Yeah, big time. Um, but I, I was really trying to figure something out because I was, you know, I was, you know, I was, you know, mid thirties now. I'm thinking, what's, what's, what's going on with this? And so there's this guy named Christopher Summers and he has this thing called, it's called gymnastics bodies, which is probably another reason I get made fun of. But um one of the things he does a lot is it's all body weight strength training. And um, there's also a lot of flexibility that's included in that. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that I found was that putting this into my, you know, my weekly workout stuff that I do, mm-hmm. I feel a lot stronger. I feel, you know, there's all, you know, I feel better. I, all the aches and pains have, have pretty much gone away. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you look at a lot of cyclists and you're talking about a lot of these exercises. What are your beliefs for, you know, training upper body versus just lower body stuff? And how important is it to, to train the upper body uh, in conjunction with the lower body? It's really important. I mean, when you're speaking about cycling um, or and running, you know, like once you lose form and like once your shoulders start to sloop on your run and you're bent forward a little bit, you lose speed. Um, yeah. So, you know, when your upper body is really strong, strong core, again, aerobically strong, it's got to be able to handle what you're putting it through. Yeah. Um, then you know, you maintain good form throughout. And if you look at cycling, whether you're in a time trial position or whether you're on a road bike or any other bike, um, you're in that position on the handlebars pressing and your upper back is taking that beating. And so if the, like your, um, you know, your lats and stuff, like once they get weak, um, then that's part of your core and that starts to weaken and your handling starts to weaken and you slow down. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. So let me, let me ask you this. One of the things that I, I, I loved about when I first started doing this is, is that, you know, the, the guy that does this said that, you know, strength and flexibility are both equally important. And so, mm-hmm. you know, you can be as strong as you want, but if you don't have the flexibility, you know, you're, you're not in very good shape and you can be as flexible as you want, but if you don't have the flex, you don't have the strength, right. the same thing. So you've talked a lot, a couple of times now about yoga. So What's your belief on flexibility? Are we talking active stretching, dynamic stretching? Um, do you think yoga is the best fit for that? How, how does that work into a, to somebody's training? I think it, yeah, we're, it, it needs to be incorporated weekly. Um, and okay. and there's, there's a limit to it all. I mean, I got really good at – when I first started yoga, I wasn't able to touch my toes. Um, <laughs> and, and then, you know, 10 years later, I was putting my feet behind my head. And I, I found out that too much flexibility, it wasn't a good thing. Um, right. You know, I was focused on it too much and focused on the strength. Um, but flexibility allows you full range of motion. Um, and with age, especially, um, I see a lot of people get tight hips. And uh, when you get tight hips, then that starts to affect your back. Um, um, and the other thing is the hamstring. So um, I did an article on the muscles used in cycling a while back. It became very popular, but I created this graph and uh, I studied it through all the studies and stuff. And you find out that the hamstrings in the cycling stroke is actually used almost as much as the quads, um, but everyone forgets to stretch the hamstrings. And so yeah. they become really tight on the bike. Wow. Um, and then that becomes an issue. So doing simple stretches such as, um, again, back to yoga, there's so many yoga poses that actually hit like yep. several muscle groups just by doing one like pigeon pose. Um, yeah. It's the hips, the hip flexors, you know, it's painful, but yeah, I suck at that one. The yoga teacher's always like, we need about six blocks for this guy. His hip is like <laughs> higher than his head somehow. I don't know. <laughs> you got a few people behind you pulling on your leg. You're yeah, like, exactly. okay, we're going to get it. We're going to get it loose. Yeah. So uh, one other question that kind of coincides with stretching is I've heard people have the argument they'd say, I'd rather have you foam roll for five minutes versus stretch for an hour. What are your thoughts on foam rolling versus stretching? And should they be done together? What's the, what's the best, best approach for that? Well, I'm not a physical therapist. And so uh, on that one, I probably wouldn't be the expert to answer okay. uh, that question precisely. But I will say that both are an advantage. Um, I do see a chiropractor. Um, he's really good and he does the deep muscle um, yeah. you know, treatments. And 
man, he he makes me squirm off that table. Oh. Like he'll put his elbow <laughs> oh, into my oh man, it hurts. <laughs> yeah, been there. But you know what? I walk out of his room upright, and I'm like, great. So um, I think that the deep muscle stuff is good, and that's where the foam roller comes in and really hitting some of those trigger points. I think that's good. Um, and then the stretching. You don't need to stretch for an hour. I mean, if you did 20 minutes, uh, you know, a few times a week, that'd be great. It, yeah. It would do a lot. Um, but just make sure that when you're stretching, um, you're, you're hitting up, you know, try to hit everything. Uh, the quads, the, the hamstrings, the, the calf, um, your lower back. You know, lay up, yeah. Yeah. Right, all that stuff. Right. Hit it all. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah. Awesome. Simple. Perfect. Um, one, you know, one question about when you're getting back to training with strength workout, is it, is it better to skip a bike ride and do some strength work at, you know, different phases or is there, you know, you talk a lot about perceived effort and how we feel. Is, is there a time when we want to, you know, say, Hey, today I'm feeling this, maybe it's better to put some in some strength work, uh, versus going out on the bike. And, and to add to that, does, does skipping a bike ride to do strength work result in better cycling performance? Cause it seems counterintuitive. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, if I pull out my crystal ball and try to figure that, that one out, <laughs> I'd say it's saying to me, I don't really know. Um, yeah. I love so, honesty. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, like, uh, if you, if you know, like today it's uh, 20 degrees out and a bunch of new snow. So I don't know if uh, an outdoor workout would be good. So you're, you're stuck inside and uh, on some rollers. And so to add strength training to that, would that be a good day? Even if I did strength training yesterday? Yes. It, it would. Um, it's all going to help you. But as you're getting closer to the race season and races, that's kind of when... So early season, sure, you can get away with that. Saying, all right, I'm not going to ride today. I'm going to do a good core workout. And uh, maybe I'll do a 20-minute jog to add on to it. And then I'll work out tomorrow. That's okay. Um, yep. But as you're, you're getting closer to race season. Now, that's when you kind of... You want to talk about peaking. Um, you know, you don't want to do too much strength work because you don't want to take away from what you're doing on the bike and especially the few weeks leading into a race you kind of want to be really focused and you want to focus you know whether it's if you're doing triathlons you want to focus on your bike run swim stuff um you want to focus on the high intensity high intensity stuff and you need the energy for that high intensity stuff so you don't want to take away from it by doing you know you know 30 40 60 80 squats um so you know, awesome. There's a, there's a balance with it. Nice. We had a couple uh, user questions that we we always ask people to to throw in a couple things if they want some things asked. And one of the questions that was asked and we thought was pretty pretty interesting is for men specifically over the age of forty with declining testosterone levels, which is kind of a it's kind of been a fad thing lately. But you know, if you medically test that you have a declining testosterone level, is there benefit to doing more strength work uh, to get that to you know to improve your performance on the bike? Sure. Um, I see more of a benefit. Uh, I see a benefit to strength work throughout all ages, but um, as you age, it um, sucks. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> you, you, uh, you, 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 uh, you, you tend to get more aches and pains. And I see a lot of, um, there are way more issues than the older um, and compared to 25 year old rider. Um, okay. Wow. Well, and so, so, yeah. so basically what you're saying is that strength work becomes more important for older athletes. Yeah, I think it does. Um, okay. You know, you, you have bone strength in general. I mean, you know, well, right. um, for those who run and cycle, it's, you know, they're fine. Uh, you're putting enough uh, jolt on your bones. But for the guys that just ride, you need some pounding on the bones. And yeah. uh, yep. strength, work, strength work, it allows that. So. Very cool. Wow, cool. And then the last user question we had was talking about just strength training and injury prevention in general that, you know, I've always believed that, you know, if you have more strength training, that helps with in- injury prevention. Um, do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, yes. Um, you know, and again, like I mentioned earlier, um, there is a limit to it. There's a balance to this also. If you're doing too much, you can actually cause injury um, by doing too much strength training, um, especially if you're if you're lifting, um, whether it's high reps or heavy weight with some of the Olympic lifts or bars and you're, you're, you're doing it with poor form. Um, and then... You know, so you're tweaking muscles doing that and then you're getting on the bike and then you're running. And so then everything gets tweaked and then injuries happen, um, you know, whether it's uh, tight IT bands or, or, or any of that stuff. Huh. Um, but, you know, for balance, uh, balance sake, sure. Yeah. You don't just want strong cycling muscles because eventually um, that will lead to injury um, just because you're only working certain muscles. Like you have to incorporate yeah. everything. Huh. Right, so. so, and it, I guess kind of going back to your crystal ball for saying, does a, does a strength work 
you know, result in better cycling performance. I think yeah. you could say if this, if this proper strength training is helping you prevent injury, then that gives you, you know, the ability to train longer and more consistently and consistency is king. Right. Correct. And that would in the, in the end lead to better cycling performance. So correct. correct. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we always ask our users, uh, one question on this show. And before I do that, I had to make fun of John one more time. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say that if anyone's ever seen step brothers, uh, I refer to his, uh, gymnastics bodies as karate bodies. And I say he does it in the garage. So, <laughs> yeah. um, if anyone ever hears that, that's what I'm referring <laughs> to. Um, one day anyway, we'll uh, maybe try and get Christopher Summers on the show and then we can make fun of you maybe, yeah okay let's try that <laughs> <laughs> um so we always we always end the episode by talking about uh how many watt points is this is your advice worth and i think we're going to focus on the strength training component of it so if an athlete and this is a theoretical number i know it's going to vary between different athletes but if if an athlete starts a strength strength training program and you can give me even an, a, a, a range based on ages but if they follow a strength training program throughout a year how many watts do you think it could add to their FTP if they follow it properly? Well, let me pull out the crystal ball. Okay. <laughs> I'm rubbing it over right now. I'm going to say about, you know, you could theor theoretically um, improve FTP watts in the 7 to 10 watt range just by okay. increasing overall strength and creating more balance. Um, that's cool. I think that's, I think in general, you know, um, that's a good, uh, to be realistic goal. Sweet. I think that's awesome. really cool. Okay, Mike. So that's, I mean, that's pretty much our show for the day. Um, I, I think it's such a great interview because so many of these components of, of being an athlete, you know, the stress, the fatigue, the heart rate, the power, the strength training component, it's tough. I mean, I'm an engineer and I hear all these metrics and I'm like, how do you, how do you add this together and how do you do that? So obviously, um, that's where a coach comes in. That's where someone with, like you say, 20 plus years experience can really help athletes. So, um, if somebody wants to learn more about you, where do they find that? You can just go to highlandtraining.net and, uh, all my awesome. info is there. And, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, hey, just feel free to contact me. I'm, I do this all the time every day. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a black hole of info, man. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's, still, there's still so much to learn, and uh, and that's why that's what keeps me going at it. So. Sweet, man. That's well, awesome. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show today. People are going to love this episode. It's really tons of good information, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks, awesome. man. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. All right, Chris, John, take care, y'all. All right, take All right. care. Later. Thank you for listening to this episode. Be sure to listen to episode three, where we interview the owners of Revo PT in Boulder, Colorado, to learn about treating and preventing injuries and how improving your biomechanics can help you become a faster cyclist. If you enjoyed the show, please help us by sharing our podcast and by leaving a rating or review. If you want to learn more about our company, Flow Cycling, please visit us online at flowcycling.com. That's F as in Frank, L O C Y C. L I N G dot com. You can also find us under Flow Cycling on Facebook and Instagram. Until next time, ride safe.